As I mentioned, a hot topic series. Today we're going to be talking about toxic masculinity and the patriarchy. So let's get into it. I was thinking a little bit this week uh, just about what it is to be a man and to grow up and be an adult and pay bills and have responsibilities and have to fix things and and all that fun stuff, right, that we get to do uh, as guys. And I, th- I was thinking back to, I think it was actually this weekend, last June, uh, me and Sierra had just bought our first house the end of April last year. And, uh, and so we were settling in and, and all that kind of stuff. And it was a Sunday morning, got up at 5.30, because we, we pray here at 6.30 in the morning on Sundays before the first service. So if you're ever up at 6.30 and you're bored, just come, come pray with us at 6.30 on Sunday. You're more than welcome. So I was getting up for that 5.30. I was out of water. And, uh, and so I was walking through the house, just leaving the lights off, walking in the dark, trying to, get, trying to get me another bottle of water. And I stepped into the kitchen, and I stepped right into some, a big puddle of water, a big splash. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So I flipped the light on. The AC had leaked. It, it was above our kitchen in the attic. Ceiling tiles and water all over the floor. 5.30 in the morning on a Sunday. And I just kind of stood there like this for like two minutes, just looking at it. It was like just really did, did, just staring. Didn't even know what to think. And, but then I immediately remembered, uh, I think I was about 12 years old. My little brother would have been 10. And uh, we, it was after school one day, and we were playing basketball uh, behind the house and waiting for my dad to get home to eat supper. And, and about that time, about 6 o'clock, my dad gets back, and, uh, and he pulls into the driveway. And so we're trying to finish up the game real quick. And my dad's about halfway back to the house, and my brother shoots. And being the older, more athletic big brother I was, I, uh, I stuffed his shot, like, perfectly, like, just a beautiful block shot. So I swatted that thing out of here. And as soon as it took off, it headed right to the bottom of the house, hit this little water line and water started shooting eight feet into the air. And my dad's about halfway back to the house and me and my brother are looking at each other like this. And I turn around and he stops and he just goes. <sighs> and then of course he, 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 was, he was frustrated. He was a little mad. And, and of course, 12 years old, I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong. We're just playing whatever. But then when I was standing there in my kitchen last year, looking at the water all over the floor, I was like, I get it. I understand. I know exactly what he's feeling. He just wanted to come home, eat supper, and do his routine of passing out on the couch about 8 o'clock every night. But now he had to fix a water line because his 12-year-old son blocked his other son's shot. So uh, there's, there's, it's not always fun being the man of the house. It's not always fun growing up, being an adult man, being responsible for things. But I'm reminded daily right now uh, that we don't have to deal with pregnancy or birth. Uh, and so all the men said amen in the name of Jesus. And... Uh, and so I'm reminded all the time just how, uh, just how glad I am I'm a guy and don't have to deal with the, those types of things. I just, I just get to be there and be supportive while she does all the work. And, uh, and so uh, this idea of, of toxic masculinity and, and the patriarchy is, is if you research it, it's, it's really this idea that sprung up in the past several years in culture that, that really there's some uh, inherent biases and things about men that are that are flawed, that are, are, are mistakes, and that we, uh, the way that we raise children, the way that we go about our lives, the way that we do things, are, it's toxic, just being us as men. And, 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 and then the idea of this patriarchy, idea of uh, the hatred of that, well, you know, men have been in power for forever in all these positions of power. So, you know, if they're in power and everything's wrong, then everything's wrong because they're in power and it's men's fault and all that stuff. And so some of that, they get into some extremes, right? And, you know, some of them take it a little far and, you know, it's men's turn. To, to shut up and take a back seat and let us women lead and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, I get it because we've kind of done that for the past couple thousand years. And so they're probably they're like, hey, it's our turn. We're going to lead, you know. And so if you research it, it really doesn't come out of a terrible place, right? And they talk about, you know, how sometimes as guys, we're not so good at being vulnerable and, and really dissecting our emotions and figuring out why we're, we're blowing our lid and why we're angry. So we just kind of push it back down and try not to think about it and some other things and different. You can go and look all that stuff up why they say those things. But, but really, I just wanted to hit on the idea that, that as men, just because we make mistakes, just because we're not perfect, doesn't mean that it's time for us to shrink back and take a back seat, but it's time for us to really allow God to work in us make us who he created us to be and lead in the way that we were created to lead as, as men, as fathers, as husbands. Because men aren't to blame. Mankind and sin is to blame for our issues, right? Men and women. And that's the thing. God created man and woman. 
And we need to be men of God, women of God, working together to accomplish God's vision for our families, for our communities, for our churches, for this world. And whenever we're trying to do it out of ourselves, that's where it can become toxic. That's where it can get out of balance. That's where we can cause some issues and get into some trouble and, and doing things out of our own strength, doing things out of ourselves. And, and for, for far too long, I think even uh, men in the church, we've allowed culture to define what being a man, what being a father is supposed to look like and, and how that's supposed to operate. And so we're going to talk biblically about what some of those things look like and some pitfalls to avoid. Um, but, you know, you can see the devaluation of, of manhood and fatherhood, even in what they call family and kids shows nowadays, where the dad, if he's in the show, he's usually kind of the the idiotic goof, you know, is kind of oblivious to everything. He's always the butt of the joke, always getting in the way, right? Or uh, he's just an absent and he's not there and he's caused a lot of pain. And he's, you know, there's not many shows where there's just this great depiction of a great, strong, you know, leading father who's making an investment in their children. But, but entertainment is a reflection of culture. And so if it's in there, that means that's what a lot of people's experience is, that, you know, that their father may not be there, may be absent. 25% of households in America don't have a male figure present. 25% off the top. And that's just no male figure in the home, period. You know, there's a lot of families, a lot of households that, you know, that it's, it's, it's a guardian, a, a grandfather, a stepfather, and we're grateful for all those men that stepped up and did something that they didn't have to do in somebody's life, and we're always thankful for those guys. But, but there's so much in our society that is wrong with the way that we're operating as fathers and in manhood and all those types of things. And so it's seen as toxic. And so their suggestion then is that well, just men just need to take a back seat and stop doing so much. But really, we just need to operate how God created us to operate and be the men of God that God called us to be. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. See, fatherhood is, is a delicate balance. You got to work and provide and work hard and put in the hours. But we also have to be home and be present and make an investment in our children. And, 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 and but we also still, you know, you, you got to put in the hours. And so you got to find when I'm home, when I'm at work and you got to discipline and correct, but you also got to love and exercise grace, but you can't exercise too much grace because you got to discipline and correct. And you got to, and, and then, and then you got to, you know, also be a husband and be married and see about their needs and invest in that relationship. And there's just a lot going on with all of that with fatherhood. But then in manhood, just in general, and I, I was telling Sarah this, I was thinking about this this week, and she agreed, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some of these. But just being a man sometimes is a delicate balance, and trying to even be married. And so, you know, Sarah says that she likes that I'm more of a, a manlier type of guy, and she's like, I like that you're strong and manly and all that stuff. But, but I want, I still, like, I want to cuddle and watch romance movies in the rain <laughs> while it's raining outside not just want to do those things, I want you to want to do those things because if I ask you, then it doesn't count. You just have to like know and, do, right? I like that you're, you know, independent, you form your own opinions, you think for yourself, but as long as those opinions line up with my opinions and you agree and you don't, you take my side, right? You don't, you don't go against what I'm saying, right? I like that you, you know, you used to be athletic. She doesn't say used to be, she says still athletic, but I say used to be athletic. <laughs> You're athletic, you're into sports, you like all that kind of stuff, but, but maybe you should just skip golf this weekend so we can go paint in the park and we can just have a day in the park. And I, and I have, I'll admit, I've painted in the park um, because as husbands, we do things all the time to serve our families and our wives and make sure we're investing in that relationship. And so actually, what's funny is I, I still make it fun. And so if you look on my desk, there's this little uh, like stick figure that I painted to look like Jamar Chase. He's in a Bengals uniform. And so that's what I painted when we went to the park. I just put orange and black, you know, and, uh, and made that happen. And so there's, there's a delicate balance to trying to be a father, trying to be a man, trying to be a husband. And we, it's so hard to get it right. And so sometimes it feels like, well, no matter what I do, it seems like I'm doing, making the wrong decision. I'm doing the wrong thing, and, and I don't know what to do. And oftentimes when we're doing it out of ourselves, we are. But there's still time to get it right because Jesus hadn't come back yet, so we still have today and, and hopefully tomorrow, and we can still continue to make those decisions. And so we're going to look at the book of Joshua. We're going to look at the book of Joshua in Joshua chapter 24. And so in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua starts off, and he's speaking to the Israelites, and he's leading the Israelites at this point, and he starts recounting all the things that God has done, all the way back from Abraham. 
So he starts off by saying, you know, Abraham was called out of the land that he was in. He was led to the land of Canaan. God blessed him with Isaac to give him a family. And then God uh, eventually rescued Jacob's family, who was Isaac's son from famine through Egypt and Joseph, and they took refuge there and God spared them. And then God had to rescue them from Egypt whenever they were enslaved and, and sent Moses and Aaron and brought plagues and got them out. And then when they got out and got stuck at the Red Sea, then God came and parted the Red Sea and made a way through and drowned the Egyptians. And then he was leading them to the promised land and they just couldn't get it right. So now they're wandering in the wilderness after all their mistakes and God still provides for them in the wilderness. And then when it's time for him to finally go on the promised land, God defeats the Amorite army without a battle and brings down the walls of Jericho without a battle. And so he's recounting all this stuff. And he basically says, and you still turn from God. I can recount all of the stuff that we have seen and you still have chosen to serve other gods. And so this is where he picks up in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. He says, so fear the Lord. And serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? This is a very famous verse. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And so Joshua is basically saying here, make no mistake, God and sin, God and other gods of this life do not coexist. He's saying there's other gods that people can serve, that you can choose. But there's one true God, and there's either him or there's not him. There's no options. There's no in-between. Is God the one true God or there's not God? So make a choice. Choose today whom you will serve. No longer playing the fence, no longer straddling the fence, but you've got to make a choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. And so he points out two different types of gods that they're having to choose between. He, he points to the gods of their ancestors, and then there's gods of their current situation, their current culture. So we're going to look at some of those today. And so we're going to start off looking at uh, three gods of our ancestors, three gods that fight for our attention in our life uh, three gods, that, that little G gods, that try to take away from what God wants to do in our life that we can kind of slip up in that we're going to look at. And so the first one is the God of silence. The God of silence. This is Adam when Eve was being tempted, right? So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it says this, The woman was convinced by the serpent. The serpent's been trying to convince her to eat of the fruit God told him not to. She was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Watch this. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. Adam was right there, but it doesn't record him saying anything, right? God gave Adam the charge to take care of the garden. God gave Adam the charge to not eat of the fruit and to oversee those things. And so when his wife is standing there being tempted by the serpent, Adam doesn't open his mouth. Adam stayed silent. And we make jokes all the time, you know, that old dang woman in the garden, she wouldn't have ate the fruit. You know, we're all in this. But Adam was right there. Adam didn't speak up. Adam didn't say anything. You see, the temptation for us sometimes is to not rock the boat, right? Not rock the boat in our family, in our workplace, our friend group, whatever it may be, in our marriage, and to not say something. This is what David did when one of his sons, Amnon, sinned against his own sister. And I'm not going to go into detail and all that. You can read that story for yourself. You can read between the lines. But his son Amnon sinned against his own sister Tamar. And David, Scripture says he was angry. He was outraged. But he never did anything. He didn't do anything. He didn't take a stand. And in his own house, in his own leadership, David didn't step up and do anything. And actually, if you read the story, his other son Absalom, Tamar was his favorite sister. He cared for her a lot. And so Absalom is angry. He's not just angry with Amnon, now he's angry with David because David didn't do anything. And, and many times when you're in a position of leadership, silence is endorsement. Well, if he didn't say anything about it, then he must be okay with it. So Absalom for years, for years is angry. It's just growing inside of him. He's getting bitter. He eventually kills Amnon, then works his way back into David's good graces, then leads a rebellion against David because he's still angry at David and loses his own life. So David not only has something happen in his house, obviously I'm sure David did, was not endorsing, but because David stays silent, he lost two sons. 
So Amnon's killed by Absalom. Then Absalom, his oldest son, who's supposed to take over the throne, leads a rebellion. David has to vacate the palace, go on the run, and his own son loses his life because David stayed silent in the face of, of, of sin. And so if David would have spoken up, how that may have changed the whole course of that entire situation. But because David stayed silent, Absalom bitterness grew in him. And that's on David because Absalom was under David's authority. Absalom was under David's influence. And so the temptation is to remain silent. But I shared this last summer in our Summer on the Mount series. There's a difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Peacekeeping says things are going good enough. Nothing's too bad. We're just going to we're just going to ride this out. We're going to stay quiet, sweep it under the rug. And the, and the saying goes, you sweep it under the rug until somebody else comes along and trips on it, right? So that piles up enough. But peacemaking says, I'm going to, I'm going to address the situation. I'm going to rock the boat so I can get the things out of the boat so we can actually make it to the other side. And I'm going to address the issues in my family, in my marriage, in my workplace, and whatever it is. And I'm going to make peace, not just try to keep peace. Make no mistake, we need strong men of God who will speak up and stand for the truth of God's word, especially in today's culture, no matter the potential consequences. You see, the, the God of silence is often brought about because of number two, the God of power. And oftentimes the temptation is to remain silent because of the position of power, and we want to hold on to what we have, the influence that we have, and we're afraid of losing that. Well, if I say the wrong thing or if I upset somebody because I take a stand against it, then, then I won't hold any more influence or, or, or my position or, or at work. You know, it may cost me something at work or in my family, whatever it may be, because we're serving the God of power. See, this is Solomon using his wisdom and his wealth on himself. Solomon, wisest man to ever live, brought about great wealth, great influence, expanding the Israelite kingdom and, and gaining notoriety throughout the world, but he used all that on himself. And if you see at the end of Solomon's life, some of the things he's writing, he's so, he's, I mean, it's, he sounds very depressed, very upset. He says, what, what is this? All this life means nothing. None of this means anything. The sun comes up, the sun goes down, the day moves on. And he's just, he's at the end of himself because he, store, he put all that on himself and he used his power on himself. And then all the Israelite kings after him followed in, in, in that way. They used their position, their authority, their influence on themselves and, and served other gods to the point where their own people, the Israelite people, ended up enslaved in other countries because of their mistakes in leadership and serving the God of power. You see, the temptation for us is to use our authority and our strength to elevate and benefit ourselves instead of elevate and benefit others. Philippians chapter two, Paul says this in verse three, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others, be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the highest honor, the place of highest honor, and gave him the name above all other names. And this is where we love to quote and celebrate. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That came... Paul says, because Jesus humbled himself and did what God asked of him to do. And because of that, then God elevated him and used his position and his power to the glory of the Father, to the benefit of everybody else. Jesus's humility benefited all mankind for all time. And many times we think that we got to pound our chest and operate in power and influence and authority, and, and we can't let anybody challenge that. But Jesus humbled himself and used his strength for others. Our strength was not given to us as men and women for ourselves, but rather to elevate those around us and use our influence and our authority to the betterment of those around us, to bring the salvation, to bring the freedom, the healing and the hope that Christ has offered and that Christ has produced within us. In the same way that we talk about Jesus, the blessing on our lives, the salvation, the freedom that we get to walk in is not just for us, but it's to use for other people, to see them walking in the same way, to see them experiencing salvation and freedom. A great example 
I think of this on, on this day as, as Abraham Lincoln. And tomorrow, June 19th, we'll celebrate, uh, our, our country will celebrate the holiday of Juneteenth. And if you don't know what that is, that's the anniversary, the holiday of, of the Emancipation Proclamation and, and the slaves finding out that they were freed through Abraham Lincoln. And so we get to celebrate that great uh, milestone tomorrow. And obviously, through the course of history, last 150 years, we're still working and getting better and, and doing better for each other. Um, but, but that's a huge moment that Abraham Lincoln took upon himself, and he didn't serve the God of silence. He didn't serve the God of power, but rather, to the cost of his own life, stood up for other people. And you see, the thing about Abraham Lincoln is he grew up extremely poor in Illinois in a, in a log cabin with a dirt floor, didn't go to school, but taught himself to read taught himself about law and eventually passed the law exam, and then found himself in the most powerful position in the world at that time as president of the United States. And the temptation, I think, for us, and, and you've probably heard it said, you know, I got it on my own. I worked hard. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. It's about time. I deserve this. I worked hard for this. But instead of using all that on himself, Abraham Lincoln said, no, I serve God. I'm a man of honesty and integrity and I'm going to look out for other people, and I'm going to allow God to use my position of power, to use my strength to stand up for other people and to stand up for somebody else. I'm not going to be silent, and I'm not going to serve the God of power. And yet, it cost him his life. But now, there are millions of people in America celebrating their freedom today because of his decision and his choice not to stay quiet, not to serve power. And so we can't serve the God of silence. We can't serve the God of power. And then number three, third God of our ancestors, God of bitterness. God of bitterness. And often bitterness comes from comparison and competition. And we all fall in this trap, especially in this day of social media, looking at what everybody else has and what they're doing and what they're enjoying. And we want to compare and contrast. And, and, and I said this in first service, but sometimes, you know, as men, we want to puff our chest a little bit and size other guys up and look at them and compete a little bit. And I do the same thing. I'm at home. I do something around the house. I kind of walk around a little bit, you know. See, see that? See what I do? How I fix that? Well, that was pretty good, huh? Looking for that affirmation. But we'll do that. We'll, we'll puff our chest out a little bit and size other guys up and compete a little bit. But here's what happens when we're in competition with other people. Then we can't celebrate their success because that's our loss. Their win is our loss if we're in competition with them. And you see, this is what happened with Saul and David. Saul hated David because of his popularity with the people, and he let jealousy consume him, forming Bitterness. You see, Saul had an incredible opportunity. Yeah, sure, he messed up and God anointed another king and his son wouldn't become king. But at this point, David is under his influence and authority. And Saul could have taken the opportunity to say, you know what? I made some mistakes. Here's where I missed it. Here's where you can be better. Let me help you out. But instead, Saul became jealous of David because Saul was confronted. Who David was was who Saul was supposed to be. And when Saul saw David, he saw who he wasn't. And he saw where he missed it. Instead of letting that inspire him to grow and to change, he became bitter and compared himself when he was in competition to the point that he tried to kill him and put him on the run and eventually lost his own life. He turned on David because of the truth that David's life made him face. It's easy for us to compare ourselves as men, husbands, fathers, business owners, mothers, wives, women, whatever it may be. It's easy for us to compare ourselves and that, and that form bitterness in us about what God, we feel like God hasn't blessed us with, right? We start looking around at, at, at what other people have and we see it as what God hasn't given us. The wife we don't have, the husband we don't have, the money we don't have, the family we don't have. Instead of being happy for them and celebrating them and focusing on what God has given us, we're over here upset because we feel like God's blessed them more than he's blessed us. And I, I get this way a little bit. You know, I told Pastor Weston I was gonna share this, but sometimes I get, I get jealous of Pastor Weston. You know, I see him driving around in that nice white, Leather seat, heated and cool seats, backup camera, chrome accent and Dodge Ram. And I just, I get a little bit jealous. And that's why when we go somewhere together, I make him drive. God said to use your blessings for other people. So I'm going to enjoy his blessing. And I get a little bit jealous. I'm over here and I'm looking at his truck driving around. And the whole time I'm over here jealous of his truck, he's just mad because he's not six foot tall. And so he's just... <laughs> And we're jealous of each other. I said this in first service. I, um, I said, you know, if I show up next week driving a different truck, most people probably wouldn't notice. He walks in next week six feet. We're having a prayer meeting because the Lord is moving. <laughs> Miracles, signs, and wonders are happening in this place. That would catch some attention. It's silly, but it's, it's what we do. 
We're looking at what other people have as what we don't have, what God hasn't blessed us with, and we're comparing, and then we're bitter and we're angry at God because we feel like something's wrong. Or we get upset with ourselves and feel like there's something wrong with us because God hasn't blessed us like he's blessed somebody else. And we're not focused on what God can do through us. So we can't compare and be in competition and let that form bitterness. But we have to be grateful for what God has given us and allow others to inspire us to grow and to be better and to do different. And so those are the three gods of our ancestors, silence, power, and bitterness. So we're going to look now at three gods of our current culture that we must avoid and that we have to choose daily between. So number one, the God of comfort, complacency. You see, in America, we can, we can get comfortable. We can get in a routine. Guys, we work our 40 hours. We provide. We make sure our, our family has a place to live. Our kids are going to school. There's food on the table. and We just kind of get in the groove. Um, Saturday, we make some time for our hobbies and things we enjoy doing and, and, and make most Sundays at church and do some things. Why is it that oftentimes when our comfort and our routine gets squeezed, it seems like the first thing that we have to shave off is extra things with Jesus, extra things with church, right? If we got a little, if, we, if our time gets a little squeezed, well, we miss a few Sundays. If, if our money gets a little squeezed, we stop giving. And if, you know, if we get a little bit tired, we stop serving. And, and, and listen, there's, there's room to adjust and change and do all those types of things. But what I'm saying is we, we can't get comfortable and complacent in this life and in this routine because God didn't call us to that. God called us to live with intentionality and purpose, God called us to ask ourselves questions like, who am I winning to Jesus at work? Am I setting the standard for Bible reading, prayer, and worship in my home? Are my children developing a personal relationship with Jesus? Am I leading my community in a way that reflects well on God? Am I contributing to the advancement of the kingdom of God in my area and in my church and in my community? But we get so caught up in the busyness of life and we get in a routine, we get comfortable and we get settled and we get to a place in life we feel like we've arrived because it's what the American dream tells us we're supposed to do instead of living with intentionality and letting God use us. And you see the beautiful thing about serving God is that he'll use our 40 hours, he'll use our hobbies, he'll use our passions, he'll use all those things to accomplish his will, to advance his kingdom if we let him if we allow him to lead us and to use those things and work in our lives and not use them as we've been talking about to serve ourselves or to be comfortable or to be complacent with what we have. So that's the first one, the God of comfort and complacency. Number two, this is a big one, the God of lust, the God of lust. And so I have just a couple of statistics here just to remind us. And these are, these are in statistics in the church. 64% of Christian women, uh, Christian men and 15% of Christian women say they watch inappropriate images and videos at least once a month. That's only slightly lower than it is outside of the church. Young men, I talked about how sometimes it feels like it's a balancing act and everything's stacked against us. The average man is, is introduced to those things before the age of 12 in America. They're, they're behind the gun before they've even started. I know that's how it was for me. I didn't even get to start out into being a teenager. I'm already dealing with something heavy like that. And so we have to defeat this God of lust. How are we supposed to protect and empower our wives and daughters when we see women as objects of our desire? How am I supposed to, how am I as a pastor supposed to minister to and elevate and empower women in our church and in our community if I see women as an object of my desire, if I see women as an object of lust? Here's what we have to remember. That's not just somebody else's daughter, somebody else's wife. That's God's daughter. That's God's daughter. And you got to answer to him about that one day. And the other thing is, you know, we, I think we're all, uh, you know, pretty disgusted by human trafficking and we're against those things and abuse and all that kind of stuff. And, and sometimes as guys, we talk a little big, you know, give me, give me five minutes alone in a room with that guy. And I'll tell you, I promise you, he won't make that mistake again. We see the thing is it's a multi-billion dollar a year industry. And the more we watch, the more they're enticed to do those things. And so we're contributing to it. And that's on us. And this is a huge issue. And we've got to tackle this in our life. Everywhere we turn, we all know. It's in TV, movies, ads, commercials. I can't play a game on my phone without some stupid ad popping up, right? And so we have to pay attention to those things because it's not going to happen by accident. You don't walk in purity and freedom and, and see other people the way God intends you to see them by accident. I don't just wake up one day and all of a sudden, you know, I'm not struggling with things anymore. We have to be intentional about the pursuit of purity in our life because it matters. It matters. 
And if you need help with that, you can reach out to one of our staff pastors, somebody you know, a man in this church who's, who can help and lead you and ask the tough questions. Craig Rochelle, as a pastor in Oklahoma, has some really good material on these, on these issues and topics. And we talk about this a lot from the pulpit, so I'm not going to harp on it for too long. But if you need help, reach out. We can, God and sin do not coexist. We've got we've to make a choice. We've got to make a stand. We have to defeat the God of lust in our life. And then thirdly, third God of our culture, we have the God of possessions, God of wealth, God of success, you know, insert all of those things there. We just did basically a whole series on this, so I'm not gonna stay on it too long. But there's nothing wrong with success. There's nothing wrong with stuff. You know, I like stuff just as much as the next guy. I said, I'm jealous of Pastor Weston's truck. I want it. He may turn around one day and it's gone. But, you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with any of those things. It's got to be in its proper place. Everything is a tool that God can use in our life. The question is, is it God of our life or is God God of our life? I said this uh, in our Ten Commandments series in young adults discussing the first commandment about no other God before him, you know, serving God only. If God asks you for something and the answer is no, then that's God of your life and not God. That's just a simple way of testing, okay, what is really in control of my life? So we have to assess those things. So all those things can get in the way of us becoming and leading and being who God created us to be, functioning how God created us to function. And it gets in the way. So I've hit on these six different gods of our ancestors and culture. And so it can really sound like there's just a lot to look out for. And the odds are stacked against us and it's gonna be hard. And it's kind of like, I'm gonna mess it up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a mistake. I'm gonna mess it up somehow. Yeah, we will. We're all going to, it's gonna happen. The thing is that God has empowered us and God is for us. I'll take us back to Joshua chapter one. Before Joshua ever gets to chapter 24 and lead them into the promised land and making them make a choice, Joshua one, Moses has died. And now Joshua's in charge. Some big shoes to fill. There's Moses. He's been leading these people, took them out of Egypt. There's Moses. And Joshua has to step up and lead. And, and, and God says this to him in Joshua one nine. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So yeah, the task is great. It's daunting. There's trials, there's troubles, there's struggles, there's things we gotta face. But God is with us. God is for us. Psalm 94 says this, unless the Lord had helped me, I would soon have settled in the silence of the grave. I cried out, I am slipping, but your unfailing love, O Lord, supported me. When doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. John chapter 16, verse 33, I've told you all this that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. First John 4, 4, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit of this world. And so the good news is, God is on our side and God will empower us. God will equip us. God will extend us grace. God will make a way out for us for every temptation. The Bible promises that. God will work in our life and create in us to be the men, to be the women that God created us to be. The problem is we gotta make a choice. It'd be nice if God came down and just did it for us. I wish sometimes he would. But in the same way, I don't just expect Jesus to show up at my work and do my job for me. Can't just, Jesus has offered us every tool. Jesus has offered us everything we need. We gotta make a choice. We gotta stand and choose. See, masculinity, manhood, fatherhood, it's toxic when it's out of ourselves, when we're doing it for ourselves, when we're trying to do it apart from God and we're listening to what everybody says we need to be, what we should be, what we need to do, where we need to go. But when we line it up with the truth of God's word, when we allow God to create us to be the son, the daughter that he created us to be, then we can lead well, we can love well, we can serve well, we can do the things that he has asked us to do. So in these last days, I would encourage us with this, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. It's not time for us not just as men, but as Christians, to shrink back and to be quiet and to stay silent. We need men and women of God who will lead their families 
teach their children, love their spouse, serve their community, lead their workplace, stand for truth, not back down, but draw a line in the sand, dig their heels in and say, you know what? God, God says this, and this is what I'm sticking by. This is the truth of God's word, and I'm not backing down. And I choose today. As for me and my family, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And yeah, there's a lot of other gods fighting for our attention. There's a lot of other things in this life that can get us distracted and get us off track. But I know that God is in me, and he is greater than all of those things. As long as I choose him every day when I wake up, I know God's on my side. And I can be the man. I can be the woman that God created me to be. Hey, if you just committed your life to Christ, or maybe you recommitted your life to Jesus, listen, we want to celebrate with you and connect with you. The best way that we do that is through a text. Would you text I believe to 84576? It is as simple as that. Again, that's I believe to 84576. We have a team standing by that would love to connect with you. They want to celebrate with you. In fact, we even want to pray with you. All you have to do is go to our website, EuniceChurch.com, or you can download our church app, New Hope Eunice. Either way, we have a prayer request tab that you can fill out right there that goes directly to our team and our staff. And we would love to start this journey with you, connecting with you and celebrating with you. While you're on that, check out all of our events that we have going on here at New Hope. Man, join a small group. Sign up for Next Steps and we can promise you this, that this will be your church home and you can find a place here. Before you go, simply open up your hands like I'm handing you a gift and please let me pray a special blessing over you right now. God, I pray, Lord, for every person watching that you would bless your people. God, that you would shine your face upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace and help us, Holy Spirit to anoint us and to accomplish the vision that you have given us here at New Hope, and that is to meet people and grow closer to you together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you again for watching, and stay tuned for anything and everything that we have going on here at New Hope. God bless.